Hello, Mishmacha. It's Courtney, America's Jewish Mother, and uh, I am here with a Friday Reads Thursday edition because, um, well, one, because tomorrow uh, Lindsay and I are starting our eight days of the holiday book exchange uh, thing that we're doing, so I'm already going to put out a video tomorrow. So partially it was um, because I didn't want to have to worry about putting out two videos in the same day, and um, the other part is that I don't know about y'all, but I mean, I've tried, I tried in earnest for the first several days of Vlogmas to keep up with everyone's videos who was doing Vlogmas, and then after a few days I just kind of gave up because my, my watch later list is totally out of control, I'm missing normal things like people's just regular Friday Reads <laughs> videos and stuff like that. I have ones that from a week ago that I haven't watched and yeah, it's it's out of control anyway. Um, so all of that to say, hi, I'm here with a Friday Reads Thursday edition. So um, you may or may not have noticed that I did not put out a Friday Reads video last week and that is because um, I only finished one book last week and it was a book that I wrapped up in my um, November wrap up video. So I figured there was really um, no point to doing that, especially since I'd already talked about that book. Um, so anyway, so within the past week I have finished three books, um, and they were all books that, well with the exception of one, um, two of the three books were books that I, you know, had started reading in November and carried over into December, um, and one is a, is a new book that I finished for December. Um, so anyway, so I finished three books and I'm currently reading three books, so I would like to share those with you. Um, the first book I finished was Chekhov's The Lady with the Little Dog and Other Stories. Um, so Chekhov actually died quite young from tuberculosis, which I did not know. So this says 1896 to 1904, and those are in fact the last years of his life because he died in 1904. Um, let's see if it says the age that he died. Oh, nope, I'm gonna have to do math for that. Okay, wait. I think it's 44, so yeah, that wasn't too complicated. <laughs> so, but still, quite young he died, um, again from tuberculosis. So this this collection has 14, thir no, 13, 13 stories in it, um, all written in the last years of his life. Um, one of them is quite lengthy, it's almost sort of novella length, um, it's called My Life, it was about 90 pages long, it was the long, longest one by far in the collection. Um, this this collection was sort of a mixed bag for me and, and I mean honestly I think the vast majority of short story collections are gonna be a mixed bag for people because I think they're always gonna be stories that you connect to more and you feel more invested in than others um, but you know by that same token it may well be that somebody else could read this collection and connect to different stories than the ones that I connected to etc etc um, so I ended up giving this three and a half stars. Um, many of the stories in here are kind of sketches of rural and peasant life. Um, those were the stories that I did not feel as strongly invested in as the ones that were a little bit more character driven. Um, I just think within the span of a short story it's hard to just give a sketch of life. I think it's a lot easier to do that in a novel or a novella than it is in a short story. Um, the ones that were more character driven I liked a lot more. Um, so those included uh, About Love, Ionich, The Lady with the Little Dog, um, and The Bride. There might have been one other one. Um, but anyway, so like I said, I ended up giving this three and a half stars because it was kind of a mixed bag for me. Um, but again, if you like Russian classics in general, um, or you like stories that are kind of like sketches of life, especially rural or peasant life, um, then you might like this. Um, I also really appreciated the notes in the back of the book, um, each of them. Each of the stories um, in the back has a, a note about its publication history um, and what Chekhov was, was doing um, as he was working on the story, how long it took him to complete it, and then it has references um, from the story that are made to works of Russian literature or particular places or people or biblical allusions, things of that sort. Um, so yeah, three and a half stars.
Um, I also finished this week Kevin Young's volume of poetry, Black Mariah. Um, I mispronounced this before, but it does in fact say at the very beginning of the volume, Black Mariah rhymes with pariah, slang meaning a police wagon or hearse. So, um, I believe this collection was published in 2005, around 2005. Um, this is, I have to say, probably the coolest thing I have ever actually personally read. <laughs> so um, it's an extremely cool concept, this idea of telling the story of a film noir in verse, right, or, or giving you a film noir in verse. And in fact, the cover says, poems produced and directed by <laughs> Kevin Young, um, as if it is in fact a film. Um, so within this volume, there are five reels, as it were, um, and we follow the stories of uh, AKA Jones, who is a detective private eye, um, and we also follow Delilah Redbone, who was his love interest um, at one point or another. Um, and so yeah, we kind of just see what happens to them throughout the volume. Um, and again, it's a very cool concept. The actual poems themselves reminded me a lot of Langston Hughes's jazz poetry. Um, so I thought I would read you um, probably one of my favorites from in here. By the way, a lot of them look, I don't know how well you can see this, but a lot of them look like this. Um, so they're just, you know, like two lines. Um, uh, throughout the throughout the poem. So this one is called The Grift. On his back, he lugged around his life stuffed into a croaker sack, full as a thought balloon in some cartoon. Flim flam man, seven dollars and a plan. His face looked like a pool table, deep pockets for eye sockets, faded red, but felt was something he never did. Flim flam man, ten fingers and a plan. His real home was six feet beneath ground, he was just up here renting breath with the rest of us. Short-term lease he's fallen behind on. Flim Flam Man, two empty hands. So, um, so yeah, so if you enjoyed that poem, uh, I think you will probably enjoy this collection overall. There's a lot of clever wordplay like in the poem that I just read. Um, and again, for me, even though this collection was again extremely cool, probably the coolest thing I've ever read, um, to me, None of the individual poems sort of rose above the just sort of initial concept of being really cool um, to something extraordinary. Um, so for me overall, the collection ended up being three and a half stars. It was a very enjoyable read, um, and I would certainly recommend it, especially if you have an interest in jazz poetry or you're a fan of Langston Hughes um, or you like film noir. Um, or you're just interested in contemporary African-American poetry. Um, any of those things, I would, I would recommend the collection to you because it's, it's quite good. But again, for me, um, even though I enjoyed it and even though it was a very cool concept, it never really kind of went beyond a very cool concept. And so that's why it landed at, at three and a half stars for me, even though I did, I did like it and I would recommend it. So yeah, that's Black Mariah. Um, and then I just today finished Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s Stony the Road. White uh, sorry, Reconstruction, White Supremacy, and the Rise of Jim Crow. Um, so this book was very good. I ended up giving it four stars. Um, I will say that because it is written by Henry Louis Gates, who is an academic by profession, um, I felt as an academic myself that it was written in a format that's fairly accessible, um, especially to have been written by an academic. Um, however, so having said that, it's still quite dense in places, um, so I felt like I couldn't read maybe more than about 15 to 20 pages of this at a time before I was like, okay, that's enough for now, <laughs> um, even though I did find it quite interesting. So uh, basically in this book, Gates starts off with the premise um, that the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s is also known as the New Negro Renaissance, um, which I already knew that. Um, especially because Alan Locke um, is someone who I studied uh, in my 
graduate school studies in American pragmatism, um, and he actually edited a volume that came out in 1925 called The New Negro that published many famous Harlem Renaissance figures, including Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, Langston Hughes, etc., etc. Um, so I knew that. But anyway, so, um, so Gates starts from the premise that um, if there was, in fact, you know, during the 1920s um, and into the 30s, a, a Harlem Renaissance, or as it was known, a new Negro Renaissance, then what is the old Negro, <laughs> right? Um, it's necessarily some sort of reaction to um, an old Negro um, in, in the creation of this figure of the new Negro. Um, and I will say that question is actually somewhat disingenuous <laughs> that he starts from because late in the volume, in fact, in the last chapter of the book, he comes to a discussion of Alan Locke's volume, The New Negro, and Locke himself actually even takes up that question um, in an essay in the volume or maybe even in the introduction to the volume of, you know, that the new Negro is in some ways a response to the old Negro. So I did, in fact, find that question that Gates starts from a little bit disingenuous as I read on, but, um, but anyway, so Gates essentially here traces um, what the reaction of the Harlem Renaissance and this idea of the new Negro, what is that a reaction to? Um, and what he really talks about in here is that it's a reaction to reconstruction and um, the passing of Jim Crow laws um, during Reconstruction era and afterward that were known as, for white Southerners, known as redemption, which is basically a rollback of all of the legal rights that were gained by African Americans just after the Civil War, um, and a gutting of all of the social, economic, and legal privileges. Um, and so Gates ultimately sort of concludes that, and this is the part that I thought was was quite important. Um, he ultimately kind of concludes that the Harlem Renaissance, aka the New Negro Renaissance, um, was in some ways bound up with, in some significant ways, bound up with the politics of respectability. Um, and that is not something I've ever heard, that's not an argument I've ever heard made before, and I found that quite fascinating. Um, so that I thought was very significant, especially to our understanding of Harlem Renaissance era literature, um, that it's you know, it's, it's maybe not so much um, about pride in African-American accomplishments as much as it is a sort of showing white America that there is a segment of black America that is just as respectable as they are and can produce a literature art um, that's just as intellectual and just as creatively fueled as white Americans can. So I found that very significant and fascinating. Um, so for that, I gave this collection four stars, um, or this, this uh, it's not really a collection, but this volume, four stars, um, because it is quite significant to um, our understanding of the Harlem Renaissance era. Um, and also I will say in the book, um, Gates follows every individual chapter with um, a selection of photographs. Um, that are sort of supposed to be illustrative of what he has been talking about in the chapter um, with ways in which African Americans are represented in popular media, both by whites and blacks and also in um, scientific, scientific, <laughs> more like pseudoscience um, study and things of that sort in the Reconstruction slash Redemption slash Harlem Renaissance era. Um, so that was all interesting. I kind of wish that the photographs had been accompanied by more explanation because some of them were a little on the small side and it was hard to make everything out and I wasn't always sure what I was supposed to be paying attention to or taking away from the pictures and photographs. So even though I appreciated their inclusion, I do wish that more was said about them. Um, but yeah, overall I thought this was a really, um, a really significant read in terms of especially talking about reconstruction and redemption, which I had never heard the term redemption before, um, because we don't often talk about reconstruction. We often skip sort of straight to straight from emancipation to 
the Harlem Renaissance, and we don't necessarily talk about all the in-between stuff. Um, so for that, I found this quite significant, and also because of, of what I said about his argument about the Harlem Renaissance being bound up with respectability politics, which was quite um, provocative and interesting. Um, so yeah, four stars, but again, I think if you are not accustomed to reading academic texts, you may find this challenging and kind of dense. And again, I personally found it a little dense, even though I thought it was um, written in a fairly accessible style. Um, so I definitely wouldn't try to, you know, sit down and read this in the afternoon or even over two or three days, but four stars. So that's everything I finished this week. So now, on to my current read. So I'm currently reading The Shadow King by Maza Mangaste, I think is how you pronounce her name. Um, so this is our pick for Lindsay of Lindsay's Book Life, um, the virtual book club that she hosts. We, we are going to um, meet to talk about this book on Sunday. I have 140 pages left um, and I am, I'm on schedule to finish it so I have to read 40 pages for the next three days and then I'll have 20 pages left on Sunday before our meeting so boom I'm gonna finish this. Um, and yeah, so this has been all over booktube, so I'm not going to say too much about it right now. Um, but I am, I am enjoying it, even though it's not exactly, it's not like an enjoyable read, right? Because it's about war, and um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that's happening. So you know, serious trigger warnings in here for violence, sexual assault, lynchings. Uh, yeah, so um, definitely don't recommend reading this right before bed. That's for sure. Um, so I'm currently reading that. I'm also currently reading Leave the World Behind by Ruman Alam with Raina of Rainier Books. Um, he's ahead of me though. Um, I'm a quarter of the way into this. Um, I need to catch up with him because he's already halfway through. Um, but I will say this is, this is a pretty quick read uh, so far and I am finding it engaging and enjoyable. Um, and again, this has been all over booktube so I'm not going to say too much about it right now. I'll save that for when I wrap it up. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I am curious to see how the interactions between the white couple, Clay and Amanda, and the black couple who showed up, Ruth and GH, um, how that will play out. Um, but again, more when I'm further into the book and, and probably when I wrap it up. Um, but yeah, enjoyable so far. Um, and the last book I'm currently reading, I don't have a physical copy because I'm reading it on ebook, but this is um, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race by Rini Edo Lodge who is a British writer, um, and I'm not far into this at all. Um, I started it, gosh, probably over a week ago, and I haven't picked it up, probably because I was trying to prioritize finishing uh, the Chekhov stories and, and Stony the Road, but I think now that I'm done with both of those, I can turn back to the Rini Edo Lodge book. I am not even 10% of the way into that yet. Um, so again, more thoughts on that to come later. So that is everything I either finished this week or am currently reading. Um, if you have thoughts about any of these books, I would love to know that. Please feel free to let me know that down in the comments below. Um, and let me know what you have been reading and enjoying lately. So thank you for watching. Um, I hope you're all doing well and staying healthy. I hope you're doing good reading whatever you're reading. And until next time, would it kill you to call your mother?